Good afternoon and thank you for coming today as we remember and we honor and celebrate the life of Betty Cornell. As we're gathered here today to remember Betty's life, we also want to make sure we take time to give praise to the God that created her and gave her life, the one who sustained her for over 90 years, and to the one that redeemed her and saved her, and to the one who called her home to heaven just a few days ago. Looking back at the records, it was around 22 years ago when the Cornells would have retired from full-time pastoring ministry and they became a part of this church. And while it's been several years since Betty was well enough to be able to be here in person, we're thankful she's able to come back to church one more time where we can give God praise for her life and take some time to honor her today. Now, when she was here in our services, sitting right back here, she came to worship. She didn't come just to observe. She came to participate. And I know nothing would thrill her any more today than why we're here for her funeral service, that we would just take time to worship. And we'd also take time to give the Lord praise for all his goodness. So we welcome each of you here today. And on behalf of the family, thank you to so many friends and the guests that have come to be here to pay your respects today. And most of all, we're welcoming the presence of the Lord to seal his approval upon a life well lived for him. So may the Lord bless each part of this service today. Betty Jean Cornell, age 90, of Bayer, PA, was born on September 4, 1932, in Concord, North Carolina, to Merle W. and Esther L. Sessor Gates. <laughs> She went to be with her Lord this past Wednesday, November 16th, from her earthly residence to the mansion prepared for her in heaven. She ministered as a pastor's wife in the Allegheny Conference and Connection for 44 years, also serving as an elementary teacher for many of those years. Sister Cornell was secretary of the Connection Women's Missionary Society for 20 years. At the time of her passing, she was a member of the Indiana Wesley Methodist Church. Sister Cornell is survived by her loving husband of 68 years, whom she married on July 24, 1954. Also surviving are these are three children, Deborah Jean Cornell of Cleveland Heights, Ohio, Mark and wife Christine of Centerville, Pennsylvania, and Darla Ruth and her husband Jonathan Gates of Bluefield. Three granddaughters and three grandsons also mourn her passing. Sharna Hager and her husband Brandon, Emily 
Joy Miller and her husband, Ray, and Catherine Yates. Also, her grandsons, Timothy Cornell and his wife, Emma, William Yates, and Christian Yates. Six great-grandchildren complete the family circle. Abby, Lydia, Becky, Esther, Sarah, and Ben. She was preceded in death by her parents and one sister, Faye Nell Lowder. In thinking of Sister Cornell, I'm reminded of the great woman of Shunem, an acquaintance of the prophet Elisha. The scriptures tell us that when he passed by her home, she constrained him to eat bread. And so as often as he passed by, he turned him hither to eat bread. Then this lady prevailed on her husband to fix up a little chamber with a bed, a table, a stool, and a candlestick for the use and comfort of the prophet. This lady is described, this lady of Shunem is described as great, which means that she was a noble woman who had fine personal qualities of honesty, generosity, and courage, and high moral principles. This lady of Shunem also is noted for her hospitality and her deep spirituality. And I thought of Sister Cornell, she was a great and noble woman marked by it with fine personal qualities and high moral principles. The proof of a noble character in someone is their daily life, living surrendered to Jesus, imitating Jesus and becoming more and more like him every day. And that, I think, describes the life of Betty Cornell. A noble person trusts God's provisions and obeys his commands and rests in his love and his power gives us everything we need for a godly life. Like the great woman at Shunem, Sister Cornell had the gift of hospitality and among her many talents and enjoyments, she liked to bake pies and probably that's why Elisha passed by her, her house so often <laughs> because prophets then and now have a knack for knowing where the best meals can be found. <laughs> And she loved to entertain in the spirit of Christ. The Cornells were true friends to us and, and supported us greatly. And as often as we passed by, they constrained us to come in to eat bread. Sister Cornell's life was marked by a carefulness and an honesty and a simplicity in behavior as become a coldness. A true example to the young women. She was a noble lady of a gentle and quiet spirit never out of the limelight, but always steady and faithful and praying. And may God bless the memory of this great and noble saint. Amen. The young mother set her foot on the path of life. Is the way long, she asked, and her guide said, yes, and the way is hard. You will be old before you reach the end, but the end will be better than the beginning. The young mother was happy. And she would not believe that anything could be better than these years. She played with her children. She gathered flowers for them along the way and bathed with them in the clear streams. The sun shone on them and life was good. The young mother cried, nothing will be lovelier than this. Then night came and storm. The path was dark and the children shook with fear and cold. The mother drew them close and covered them with her mantle. Children said, oh, mother, we're not afraid, for you are near, and no harm can come to us. And the mother said, this is better than the brightness of day, for I have taught my children courage. When the morning came, there was a hill ahead. The children climbed and grew weary, and the mother was weary, but at all times she said to the children, a little patience, and we are there. So the children climbed, and when they reached the top, they said, we could not have done it without you, Mother. And when the mother lay down that night, she looked up at the stars and said, This is a better day than the last, for my children have learned fortitude in the face of hardness. Yesterday I gave them courage. Today I gave them strength. The next day, strange clouds of war and hate and evil came and darkened the earth. The children grouped and stumbled, and the mother said, Look up! Lift your eyes to the light. The children looked and saw above the clouds 
and everlasting glory, and it guided them and brought them beyond the darkness. That night the mother said, this is the best day of all, for I have shown my children God. The days and the weeks and the months and the years went on. The mother grew old, and she was little and bent. But her children were tall and strong, and they walked with courage. And when the way was hard, they helped their mother. And when the way was rough, they lifted her, for she was as light as a feather. At last they came to a hill, and beyond the hill they could see a shining road and golden gates flung wide. The mother said, I have reached the end of my journey. Now I know that the end is better than the beginning, for my children can walk alone, and their children after them. The children said, You will always walk with us, Mother, even when you have gone through the gates. They stood and watched her, and she went on alone, and the gates closed after her, and they said, We cannot see her, but she is with us still. A mother like ours more than a memory. She is a river in the presence. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the life of this God we sing. He has lived before us in the spirit of Christ. And we thank you for that. Thank you for that example. Hers truly has been a life well lived. And we just ask you today that you will put your arms about Brother Cornell and each of the children and grandchildren May they just sense your presence. We sorrow not as those who have the world, but we still need you. We need your touch each day. I ask that you will help us in this service. In every word that is spoken, may it just speak to our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I think the hymn will sing to the Lord. Turn to page 138. 138. Jesus is the sweetest name I know.
I've been told that many of you remember hearing Betty sing that song. And that was one of her favorite songs to sing. Let me just quickly read this note from our conference president. He writes, we're unable to be at the service today, but as president, on behalf of the Allegheny Wesleyan Methodist Connection of Churches, we extend our condolences to Brother Cornell and family in the homegoing of our sister in the Lord, Betty Cornell. Our prayers and love are with you all today, Reverend David A. Flowers. At this time, there's a family eulogy that Brandon's going to come and share with us, so give your attention to him as he comes to share. Uh, this is penned by Darla. At home, 655 Caribus Avenue West in Concord, North Carolina. On September the 4th, 1932, she was born Betty Jane Yates. Yes, my mom was old enough to be born at home. And no, it wasn't some fancy tub water bath birth like today. She was born to Merle and Esther Setzer Yates and big sister Fanny Nell. Just common people with minimal education trying to make a living during the <coughs> Depression. To some, she was daughter, sister, cousin, aunt, wife, mother-in-law, grandma, great-grandma, teacher, co-worker, secretary, pastor's wife, Sunday school teacher, friend, patient, but to me, she was mom. Mom was a disciplined person. At a very early age, I learned I did not bother my mother when she was reading her Bible and praying in the morning. I was only to disturb her if I was dying. <laughs> and so, as you can see, I am not dead yet. <laughs> she rarely read anything secular, a book, the mail, the newspaper, until she had read her Bible and prayed. Her disciplined life, she passed on to me. No playing after school until your homework was done. No playing until your chores were done. And when it came time for multiplication tables, you had to go over them all before you could go you may not know it, but my mom was a preacher, just like Dad. She always said Dad did the preaching on, at church, and Mom did the preaching at home. She always denied that she preached. Some of her sermons were tough. Like everything has its place, and everything in its place. Your clothes go on the hanger, not on the chair or the floor. Making your bed was the first thing you did when your heat, the feet hit the floor in the morning. Pretty sure she always gave me the most visible bedroom in each house we lived in so she could reinforce the lesson. <laughs> the living room must always be ready in case someone came to the front door and needed to get married, pray, or whatever else might be happening in the parsonage living room. We also know for a fact that she preached at church as well most every Sunday, second pew, center aisle, organ side, Brother April Troop would stand and testify. Wasn't that a wonderful sermon the sister brought to us this morning after she had taught the adult Sunday school class? And every Sunday I couldn't wait to get home from church to tease her about her preaching. Mom was a teacher and she loved teaching. I'm sure there are a few of you here today that she has taught. I am also sure I don't need to remind you that she demanded your full attention and obedience when she told you to do something, or else she took her long, bony fingers and got a hold of your chin and made you look at her so she had your full attention. And those long, bony fingers just seemed to fit right under your chin. Don't worry, I got the fingers under my chin and made to look at her with my full attention treatment often enough. I knew she meant business. She always told me, if you start the day off with all the rules, all, start the school year off with all the rules, you can relax them as the years go along. <coughs> Mom was an awesome cook, nothing fancy, just a meat and potatoes cook, but she made some awesome meals. She always, we always ate them around the table as a family. I would often ask at supper what we were eating for the supper for the next day, so I knew what to look forward to. Some of my favorites were meatloaf with potatoes, 
carrots around it and fried chicken with french fries. She also was a bread maker, and I was always amazed to see how every bun was so uniform. And then there are her pies. I think grape and cherry are my favorite. Did you know mom started baking pies right after she got married? She wanted a peach pie to just be perfect for dad, so she rolled and re-rolled the crust until it was perfect in her eyes. It was so tough, dad couldn't eat it. <laughs> mom taught me how to bake pies, but she never mastered, but I've never mastered the art of rolling a pie crust like she could. Mom also made a pickle pie once in order to get a man to come to church. Joe Gall of the Sagamore Church told mom he'd come to church if she made him a pickle pie. Mom accepted the challenge and Joe came to church. And I had no idea if the pie was eaten. <laughs> she enjoyed teaching others how to make pie as well. Mom loved being a pastor's wife. In fact, she felt called by God to be one. My dad was pursuing a teaching degree. She was set to break up with him when he answered the call to preach the gospel. For 40 plus years, she served faithfully by my dad. Many Sundays, our table was filled with guests, and oftentimes they were not expecting. She'd always get me aside and tell me to only take a little bit and wait until the guests had their fill before I had mine. She'd tell me that she would fix me something else later if need be. I never once remember there not being plenty for everyone. Mom never complained. She always seemed to handle whatever a lot was given her with grace and poise. Even in these last years of being housebound and bedridden, she never complained. She'd ask, I'd ask her, how are you doing, Mom? Her answer was always, I'm making it. Mom always gave great advice. Two things that stick out and I think about often are sometimes things have to hurt before things get better. And if you don't stand on your own two feet, no one is going to stand on them for you. Mom loved her family. She and Dad were married 68 years plus. That is a feat in and of itself. She loved us kids and was always happy for us to come home. She'd fix our favorite food, and if another of us heard about it, we'd tease them. They were Mom's pet. Mom loved her grandkids and always was proud of their accomplishments. She may have been a bit partial to my William, but they had a bond like no other. William seemed to have a sixth sense when it came to Grandma. I often chose not to tell Grandma right away if Grandma was sick or in the hospital, because he's a warrior. Once she was in hospital, but he wasn't told and she was there, he asked her something about what she was doing, and she told him she was sitting in a chair. William, with his sixth sense, asked her, is it your pink chair? <laughs> Mom loved her great grandkids as well. Although she couldn't be as active with them as she always took time to read to them or to help them with their schoolwork, always interested in what crafts they were making. Mom was many things. She has been described as sweet and kind, having a gentle spirit, being the best mother-in-law, a gracious lady, a great lady, a wonderful person, a beautiful Christian lady. Yes, Mom is all of those and so much more. She will be greatly missed, but I find comfort in knowing she is whole. Last but most important, Mom loved Jesus. He always had first place in her life, and she loved spending time with him. When I was still living at home in Sagamore, one of my jobs on Sunday was to clean the upstairs of the house. I noticed a rug on my mom's side, but never paid much attention to it, as why it was there. One day, I moved it to see what was there. It was there because Mom had wore holes in the carpet from spending time in prayer. Upon further investigation, the floorboards under the worn-out carpet had her knee imprints on them. I know many of those prayers were sent up for me, but I also know that many of them were prayed for those of you gathered here today. Mom, if I could be just half the lady that you were, I'd be fine with that. You're a great example to pattern my life after. Dad, thank you for caring for her. Gave mom the care you gave mom these last three years. You did an amazing job. You even became quite a cook. 
As a 14-year-old, I had my doubts when you couldn't remember to add jelly to my peanut butter sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> to hospice, 365, thank you for all you did for my parents these last nine months. I'm so glad that you made it possible for, for her to stay at home. Candy, Michelle, Janelle, and Amy, thank you for being with us the last few days. You all were the best. Good night, Mama. I'll meet you in the morning. sharing that and Darla for putting that together. Phil and Jeanette are getting ready to sing a special number in song. And it's my understanding when William and Betty Cornell got married in July 24th, 1954, that the song that the Wisermans are going to sing is a hymn that uh, Betty had chosen to be sung at the wedding. Is that right, Brother Cornell? Yeah. Seal us, O Holy Spirit. This hymn really was an invitation for the Holy Spirit to use their marriage, their lives, their ministry together to build up and advance the kingdom of God. And Reverend Cornell requested that that same hymn sung on their wedding day over 68 years ago be sung here at the service today. Listen as the wise women sing for us. beautiful song. <clears throat> what a powerful prayer, and it's certainly evident the Holy Spirit answered that prayer in that song that was sung at their wedding some 68 years ago. You know, it's not difficult to think of good things to say about Betty Cornell. In fact, the difficult thing for someone in my position today is to choose which good things you're going to talk about, because there's so many things that could be said, and many already have been said today. I guess you know when someone was a special person, they invite three preachers to the platform to have their service. And Darla, I didn't know you called her a preacher, so I guess it takes three preachers to have her service. But this much we know today, Betty Cornell was a saint of 
God. Psalm 116, 15 tells us, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And certainly one of God's choice saints passed away this past Wednesday afternoon and heard those words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Welcome home to heaven. To help us think of Betty's life today, I want to do an acrostic of her name, mentioning a, a character trait that stands out to me about her. The B stands for busy. Betty Cornell was a busy person, always keeping busy with something. Some of this maybe was referred to in Darla's eulogy, but she was a busy pastor's wife. If my records are correct, they served faithfully, her and her husband, in seven different churches across three states, two of those churches in this area, Wilgus and Sacramento. She was a busy homemaker, always working to make a happy home for her husband and her children. She enjoyed baking pies and cooking. Now, how many of you ever had a cookie or a pie that she made? All right, there's many hands. Even after our family moved here to pastor the church in 2016, Betty could still make some pretty wicked chocolate chip cookies, and we enjoyed those on occasion. And when someone would ask at church, we need... We need to provide a meal for someone. We need people to sign up. Even up in years, she was one of the first ones to try to get her name on the list. She kept busy as a school teacher. Indiana Wesleyan School nearby in Dixonville was privileged for many years to have her as a teacher. She was busy with participation in many church and conference responsibilities. As mentioned in the obituary, she served as the Conference Women's Missionary Society Secretary for 20 years. And to put that in perspective, that was before the days of keeping all the notes and records and minutes of the meetings on a computer or in digital format, which means she spent a lot of time writing things out by hand and using typewriters, things that the modern generations don't know too much about. I think the word busy can describe Betty Cornell. There wasn't a lazy bone in her body. You never found her idle. If she could be up doing something, she was always busy serving others. Let's move on to the E. I would use the word example. Betty lived a life that was an example for others to follow and pattern after. While I'm sure she would tell us if she had the opportunity that across the years she probably had her share of struggles and discouragements along the way, through it all, Betty lived a beautiful Christian life and was a consistent example of what a Christian should be and how a Christian should live. Across the years, her and her husband served at least seven churches as pastor and wife. And Reverend Cornell would faithfully stand behind the pulpit to preach and teach the Bible Sunday after Sunday. And I'm sure, Brother Cornell, during those years, you preached some good sermons and you had some real masterpieces at times. But your wife, Betty, lived out the Bible in her life each and every day, and she complimented your ministry. She was an example for others to follow and pattern after. No, she may not have stood behind the pulpit every Sunday to preach, but her life and her example were seen by many, and it preached loudly. It spoke for itself. It influenced many, many people. What a beautiful example of a holy, sanctified Betty was an example in her prayer life. As was mentioned, she was a woman of prayer. If you had a need that required prayer, she was one of the ones that you wanted praying. She had a deep prayer life. She was in touch with heaven. When you spent time around her, it was evident she was a woman of prayer. So many times she would come to a church service and it seemed like she brought God's presence with her because she had been spending time in prayer. She was an example in her testimonies. We all enjoyed hearing her testify. Her testimonies were heartfelt and genuine. <clears throat> Everyone knew that she was in love with Jesus and she wasn't afraid or embarrassed to acknowledge it or testify about it publicly. While I was only her pastor for a few years and she was already well up in years, I remember services when maybe we'd be singing or someone a special song would be being sung and you'd see her hand in the air and the tears running down her face. And her face always had that special glow as she worshipped the one she loved. What an example. The first T in her name will use the word teacher. As was mentioned already, Betty was a teacher. 
My wife's association and memories of Betty go back further than mine since Betty was my wife's third and fourth grade teacher in Indiana Wesleyan School. Now my wife never told me about the bony fingers. <laughs> but I'll be talking to her when we get home today to see what she hasn't told me. My wife was very fond of the memories of those years and how Mrs. Cornell took her job as a teacher so serious. How she would manage her classroom with precision. And even beyond academic excellence, which she strove for, she was a tremendous Christian example to every student that sat in her room. I'm thankful that last Saturday, right about this time, my wife and I were able to visit Sister Cornell, and my wife was able to personally thank her for the investment she made in her life by being such a great teacher. She wasn't just an elementary school teacher. She was a teacher at home. She was a teacher in the church. And certainly, she made an impact on many people, children and adults alike. God gave her talents and ability in teaching, and she taught so many people. What an influence she had. The second T, I'm going to use the word trustworthy. Betty was trustworthy. She was dependable. She was reliable. She was faithful. She was consistent, and you could just keep adding on the words. She was trustworthy as a wife. Brother Cornell... You were given a precious treasure when the Lord gave Betty to you. Over 68 years of marriage as a trustworthy wife and mother and grandmother and great-grandmother and pastor's wife and teacher and friend to so many. And in a day and age when marriages are kind of no longer deemed permanent by many in our culture, the Cornell showed us what commitment and faithfulness means and what it looks like in real everyday life. Their marriage vows meant something to them. They were faithful to each other. 68 years. That's something to be proud of. Betty Cornell was trustworthy, dependable, and loyal. The why, I'm going to use the word yielded, because Betty's life was one completely yielded and surrendered to God. The day came in her life when the Lord saved her, and the day came when she fully consecrated and surrendered her all to him. And that made all the difference in her life when she surrendered everything to the Lord. She was yielded and surrendered to God's will and God's plans, whatever that meant. Across her 90 years of life, God's plans took her different directions into many different places and through many experiences. But she was always fully yielded and surrendered to whatever God wanted and what God's plan was. On Wednesday, when a number of the family and some of us were gathered around her bed in the living room hours before she would slip away to heaven. Brother Cornell was sharing some stories and memories with us of when, I believe as a college student, when Betty really got things settled and surrendered in her heart. And what a difference it made. You see, it was that full surrender, that complete yielding to God's work in her heart and life that made all the difference. And over the last few months and years, I've heard her say and tell me, sometimes through tears, God's always taken care of me. I have no regrets. In the last number of years, Betty experienced her share of physical needs and difficulties. While she didn't enjoy all the pain and suffering, and she didn't relish the hospital and rehab facility stays, she was just surrendered and yielded to whatever God's plan was and what was taking place in her life. She would often acknowledge in our visits that God hadn't forgotten her and that he was going to see her through no matter what. Yes, Betty Cornell lived a life that was yielded and surrendered fully and completely to the Lord, which is why it really wasn't a struggle when she knew she was dying, which is why she didn't live with a fear of death and dying. When it was time for her to leave her tired, worn-out body down here on this earth, there wasn't a struggle because she lived such a yielded and surrendered life to whatever God's plan was for her. As I was thinking about what scripture passage to use in this message, I considered several. But it seemed like Proverbs 31 is the one that just fit Betty Cornell so perfectly. Listen to some of what Solomon wrote in Proverbs about a virtuous woman. And see how it describes the life of Betty Cornell. For it almost seems to me as I read through it that Solomon was thinking of her. 
when he wrote these words. He begins by saying, who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She worketh willingly with her hands. She riseth also while it's yet night, and giveth meat to her household. Her candle goeth not out by night. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yes, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Solomon asked the question, who can find a virtuous woman? We have an answer today. You can find one in Betty Cornell. Today, you, her children and family, you rise up and you call her blessed. Today, her husband praises her. And today, we've gathered to honor and celebrate the life of a woman who feared the Lord. And it's only proper and right that we do so because Solomon said, A woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Betty Cornell lived for Jesus, and now she's reaping the rewards of the way she lived and the way she died. She's now in the presence of Jesus in heaven, in a place where there's no more suffering. She no longer has to stay in bed. She can stand up straight and walk and run if she wants. She no longer needs a hearing aid. She can hear perfect. She no longer needs a pacemaker or medicine of any kind. She no longer needs the oxygen. She no longer needs hospice care or home health as much as they did for her. She's now in the presence of Jesus in a place where the Bible says there's no more sickness or pain. Brother Cornell, thank you for all the love and care that you gave your wife, especially the last few years. I know she was deeply, deeply grateful. And today we say thank you for your faithfulness and commitment. No one questioned your deep love and your commitment to her. You worked hard, you labored selflessly to give your wife the very best care she could get. Thank you. You certainly were more than true to your wedding vows to be faithful in sickness and in health. So I challenge each of us here today. How about we make sure we're in love with the same Jesus that Betty was in love with? Let's make sure our lives are yielded and fully surrendered to the same God that Betty's was. Because Betty has left us an example of both how to live and how to die. By God's grace, we can see her again in heaven someday. And I just wonder, as I use my imagination, when we, by God's grace, make it to heaven, and we start looking for Betty, we'll probably find her bowing down before the Lord praising him as King of kings and Lord of lords. You see, Jesus changed Betty's life. She lived her life for him. And now she's living in his presence forever and ever. So as we end this part of the service to honor Betty's life today, we want to do so by giving praise to Jesus. Bill and Jeanette Weiserman are coming back to sing a, another song. It's a song of praise to Jesus. May our hearts be stirred as we think about Jesus, what he did in Betty's life, and what he can do in our lives as well. And may our hearts be stirred today as we think about Jesus, and that someday all of us can join Betty in heaven, and they're joined in that heavenly time of celebration.
friends, loved ones, family, we've come to the part of the service that has so much meaning and uh, touches us all deeply because now is the time that we, we say our final fare farewell to our loved one here on earth. Many words have been spoken, beautiful tributes given to the life of Sister Cornell and also Brother Cornell, you are included. And so we were so thankful for what we have observed. We have been so privileged as a part of her church family and extended family and loved ones and friends and neighbors. We have been so privileged to see this beautiful example of holy living. There are those who don't know that this can be so, but we're so happy today to be reminded that God, through his wonderful grace, changes a life, transforms a life, till there's a certainty of heaven. There's an assurance built into their life that all is well, and that as we think of that today, Sister Cornell is in the presence of the Lord. And we cherish her memory, and we pay tribute to her, a beautiful Christ-like life wife, mother, handmaiden of the Lord, pastor's wife, 
grandmother friend. Uh, she had a concern for others that was demonstrated by compassion and kindness, a sweetness of spirit that was displayed through word and deed, a practical everyday Christianity lived out in consistent, careful living, submission to God, to Christ, to her husband, yet a spiritual strength that was tempered with grace and gentleness. One songwriter, Catherine Bonar, said it this way, fade, fade each earthly joy, Jesus is mine, break every tender tie, Jesus is mine, dark is the wilderness, Earth has no resting place. Jesus alone can bless. Jesus is mine. Farewell, mortality. Jesus is mine. Welcome, eternity. Jesus is mine. Welcome, O oh loved and blessed. Welcome, sweet scenes of rest. Welcome, my Savior's breast. Jesus is mine. William Jennings Bryan said that Christ has made of death a narrow, starlit strip between the companionships of yesterday and the reunions of tomorrow. And so, saying that, we pass on to the thought here today that, Brother Cornell, we don't know how long the journey will be from here on. We don't know what all it might entail for you your loved ones, your family. But we do have this confidence that the grace of God will be sufficient. Amen. He has carried you, folk. He has borne you on his wings and in his arms, the everlasting arms, <coughs> and he will not fail you. There's a poem entitled The Eternal Goodness. It's also a hymn by John Greenlee Whittier. It says this, I know not what the future hath of marvel or surprise, assured alone that life and death his mercy underlies. And if my heart and flesh are weak to bear an untried pain, the bruised reed he will not break, but strengthen and sustain. No offering of my own I have no works my faith to prove. I can but give the gifts he gave and plead his love for love. And so beside the silent sea, I wake the muffled oar. No harm from him can come to me on ocean or on shore. I know not where his islands lift their fronded homes in air. I only know, brother, Cornell, I only know I cannot drift beyond his love and care. And so, my brother, our dear one that loved the Lord, loved his wife, and gave us such a beautiful example of husbands love your wives, our thoughts now are with you. Your dear wife is in the presence of the Lord, and you and your family, each one of you, Debbie and Darla and Mark and the grandchildren, we commend you to the love of God. I encourage you to love and serve Jesus, just like mom and grandma did. Be faithful, be true. I really don't know what it's going to be like over in heaven. We sometimes surmise what's taking place over there. I'm not sure that I altogether know or understand it. One songwriter put it this way, I'll be waiting on the far side banks of Jordan. And I don't know if this is an actual realistic picture. I'll be waiting, drawing pictures in the sand. And when I see you coming, I will rise up with a shout and come running through the shallow waters, reaching for your hand. I just hope that it's something even better than that. That one of these days, brother, Cornell, by the grace of God, there will be that reunion. And so now, in accordance with our ceremonies and with the privileges that we have as a church in honoring one who's gone to be with the Lord, let me read just a few scriptures here in John 11, 25 and 26. 
I am the resurrection and the life. These are the words of Jesus. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. For as much, for as much as it hath pleased Almighty God in his wise providence to take out of the world the soul of Sister Betty Cornell, we therefore commit this body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, looking for the resurrection and the life of the world to come through our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose second coming the corruptible bodies of those who sleep in him shall be changed and shall be made like unto his glorious body according to the mighty working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. Shall we pray? Our Father, we bow our hearts before you today. You have touched our hearts. You have touched our lives. You have challenged our faith. You have stimulated our desire to be like Jesus as what we have observed and appreciated the life of Sister Cornell. And now, Lord, as we come to this final act of love and appreciation and the committal of her body to the ground, Lord, we realize that this is just the shell, but she is in the presence of the Lord. And so we pray your comfort and grace to each of the family today, especially to Brother Cornell. And Lord, help us each one to resolve afresh and anew, to do all that we can to meet her on resurrection morning. Be with us now, your comfort, your grace, strength to serve you and to be faithful and surround this dear family right now with your arms of love and we'll give you the praise. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for gathering here today for this service. Just a few uh, instructions and, and bits of information here at the end. In just a few moments, uh, we'll start the music back up and then the funeral director will begin dismissing those of you in the congregation from the back. If you wanna come up by the casket again to pay your final respects, you're welcome to do so. If not, you can exit to your vehicles. When it's just the immediate family left, Brother Cor Cornell has requested that there be a special family altar time. Reverend Heckman from our church is going to be reading the same scripture passage Brother Cornell and his wife read together on their wedding day and then offering a prayer with the family. The family can then have their final time of viewing before they depart of the sanctuary. At that point, any of the pallbearers are asked to meet with the funeral director right outside the double doors. When he's ready for you, he will come get you and uh, you can load the casket into the hearse. And, uh, and then there's gonna be a private burial taking place on Monday. Also, our church has prepared a luncheon immediately following the service. It's gonna be held out at the Indiana Wesleyan School in Dixonville. If you need information or directions on getting there, uh, please see me or someone afterwards that can help you <coughs> with that. Thank you so much for being here today. And thank you on behalf of myself and Reverend Carpenter and Reverend Smith for the honor of taking part in honoring the life of Sister Cornell today. We're going to turn it over to the funeral director to begin dismissing. Thank you all for coming today.